Yud Bey Tammuz. I don't see it having like a prominent part unless I miss the daf in the Sefer about the Rebbe, about being in the jail and being freed. And it, it didn't seem that that would, would did it become, did it develop as a bigger holiday afterwards? Well, the, the, the previous Rebbe uh, was born, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak was born in 1880. And his and Yud Beis Tammuz happened in 1927, so there's a whole history of the person from 1880 to 1927. That was the fo- the focus of that book that I wrote is about the overall person and the philosophy and the challenges of the time and how he, through his approach, dealt with those issues. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I would assume that I touched on it, but I, it's not definitely, you're right, in that it's not the ikar of the of, of describing the person. The, the, I, have another, I have another question, and that is, who and when did Crown Heights become the center? When did 770 become the, the center? Well... The previous Rebbe moved there in 1940 um, after, you know, the, he first was at, in Manhattan when he came at the Greystone Hotel until they purchased a house and, and he moved in, I believe, in Elul. Chafal of Elul was the Hanukkah Sabayas, 1940. Uh, it became the, uh, the, the, the central location for Chabad Hasidus in America. Uh, so it was the Friedrich Rebbe that established uh, uh, Crown Heights as a place. Uh, I would say that. I mean, you know, he was working with a group of Hasidim, Rabbi Jacobson, Rabbi Shmuel Vitten, Elder, Rabbi Kazernovsky. Uh, these were his soldiers who, you know, did all the, you know, legal work and purchasing, but uh, with, of course, the... Uh, the approval of the Rebbe. So yes, uh, the previous Rebbe uh, was the one who uh, approved, in fact, uh, Crown Heights. In fact, it's, an, it's interesting, in those days, in, in the 20s, 30s, and even 40s, uh, Brown, Brownsville, Brownsville is a neighborhood near East Flatbush, which is a neighborhood adjacent to Crown Heights. So, you know, uh, the walk from Brownsville to Crown Heights is 30 to 45 minutes. And um, Brownsville was called the, Yerush- the Yerushalayim of New York. Because, oh, yeah. It, yeah, because Brownsville had probably hundreds, hundreds of shuls of Stieblach and of, of all kinds, Hasidic, Litve, Litvak, you know, it was... Uh, that that was the 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 the, the largest from community, uh, I think, in the world at the time, except for Eretz Yisrael, was uh, Brownsville. It was loaded, wow. you know. So someone who wanted to have that experience, and many from people did, they moved to Brownsville. The Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, um, in 1929, the first time that he came to America. To raise fu- to raise funds for his brethren, for the brethren of of of, his, of Russian Jews, all Russian Jews was in twenty nine. That's when he came to Baltimore in, 19, in January of nineteen thirty, and he went to Philadelphia, and he went to St. Louis, and he went to Milwaukee, and he went to Chicago, he went to all those and the Worcester and the, the Springfield, etc., etc. That was in twenty nine thirty. Okay. If you look at it, it's online even, um, Chabad Jem put this out, you see a very a healthy person, a royal person, and that's three years after the event that was celebrating this weekend, yesterday and today, you'd be, you'd Gimel Tamos. When they, beat, when they beat him, they interrogated him, and he refused to answer them in Russian. They spoke to him in Russian, and he says, I'm only talking Yiddish. And they all knew Yiddish. These were Nebuch, these were Yevisepsius. This was the Yud- Yiddish division of the KGB. It was, you know, uh, it's, it's a very painful thing, but that, that's the fact. So he answered them in Yiddish, and he wouldn't give in to them. And there's many stories how he just defied their pressure and their tactics. And they beat him. 
I just yesterday, my wife and I were reading, they mamish hit him. You imagine Yidin hitting another, yeah, not, he, not hitting, he says one of them gave me a punch here under his chin. And not just a punch, a big zets. And he says, as he's writing his diary, I still can feel the pain of the zets. Okay? It, it, it's, it's so hard to even imagine this and talk about it and read it. it it's so painful. But that's what happened. That's what these, these, these unfortunate animals were, what they, they were so sold and they were so pr- pressured, Nebuch, by the, K, the communism that they, Mamish did this to him and other Yidin. Anyway, so, so when he came to, to America 10 years later, oh, so, so 1929, 1930, for Rosh Hashanah, he was in Brownsville. The, the Chassid Rabbi Yisrael Jacobson, who, by the way, Yoni, was a contemporary of Rabbi Shlomo Azak Aaron Kazernovsky, who you just spoke about, he was a rabbi in the Babroisk Shul in Brownsville. Uh, rabbi Kazanovsky, I was here already, and I think at that time, you should just know, he was a rabbi in Rochester, New York. That's before he came to Bensonhurst. He was up in Rochester. And, and um, these, these, uh, these um, Hasidim were with the Rebbe, so here he is, Rosh Hashanah, in Brownsville. Now you would think he would stay, he would make his, he was here in America for almost a year. He would make his center kind of for that year where most of these Yidin were. And it seems to me that he didn't uh, do that. He, in fact, ended up making his center in Crown Heights on Brooklyn Avenue, and, because, and, and Crown Heights was considered a ritzy neighborhood. The fanatics and schnorrers <laughs> were in Brownsville. And the, uh, the Jews who belonged to the conservative movement, and etc., really what were in Crown Heights. Crown Heights at that time was not an orthodox neighborhood. Brownsville was the orthodox neighborhood. And I, it doesn't say what happened, but Right after, during the Aseris Yimei Tshuva, 1929, we see that he's moved over to, um, to, uh, to Crown Heights. There is a state... There, President, then, Street, President Street has palatial homes. That's right. That's right. But, but, but the, air, the area goes beyond... The area goes beyond President Street. Yeah. Mayor Beam, the former mayor of New York, used to live on, on President Street. And that's true. But but we find we find that that um, he he uh, even Borough Park where I live, which is not as ritzy but still an upgrade I think to the uh, Brownsville community. He he he, he came here. He oh, this is already 1940, and and the Kramer brothers who lived in Bensonhurst, and they were wealthy and lawyers and very connected. And they paid for things, you know. But he told Rabbi Jacobson, like, they don't, they don't, they don't really. Uh, Rabbi Jacobson writes that they don't really understand the way a rabbi should be treated. The, the Lubavitcher Abayim, it's interesting, together with their teachings. I'm not going to say all the Abayim, but the previous rebbe was one of these rebbes of the Lubavitch that royalty was very important to the uh, position they held. There was a certain uh, image that they felt was necessary for their continuation of, of, of the Chabad uh, model. Okay? Again, I say not all Rebbes was this way. His grandfather, the Rebbe Marash, Reb Shmuel, was this way. He had, they say, a horse with and it's beautiful ho- horses with a, a chariot, a wagon. It was lavish for those days, talking about in the 1860s and 70s and 80s. So he was more on the royal side. So his grandson, the Rebbe, the Rebbe Yosef Yitzhak, the previous Rebbe, it seems that he also emulated some of that. His wife surely emulated that. And um, he told Rabbi Jacobson that, you know, uh, Rabbi Jacobson writes that they didn't understand what prestige meant and royalty meant. And subsequently to that, 
they went and purchased the home, 770, which was, I don't know if you know, it was a, a doctor's home and it was an abortion clinic. 770 was an illegal abortion clinic. Wow. And they ha the purchase of the home was because he was arrested, a doctor, and he had to sell his home. And his home he brought, uh, if, you, if you have, next time you go and you take a look, you, you can still see some of it. He, he, he brought uh, different style tiles from Italy, from here. He was a wealthy man, obviously. And he, and he created a very, very uh, wealthy, uh, he made, built a very beautiful house with an elevator. And that's why they, they were looking for a home from the previous level for a while. But they, they didn't find it. When they saw this building, 770, they grabbed it. Why? Because he was, a, he was a, a, a wheelchair patient in 1940. You know that, right? So, so, so he needed to go up and down, you know, so they had an elevator. Where did you find an elevator in a house? In, in, in not an apartment building, in a house. <laughs> Very few houses. This 770 had an, uh, had an elevator. So that was a great thing. And number two was the right neighborhood. What, is that, what do I mean? So again, this is my own thinking, uh, but based on what I, re what I believe is indicated in between the lines, that he wanted to be specifically in a non-religious neighborhood. He didn't want to be in Brownsville because Brownsville already was from. He wanted to open up Yiddishkeit to the not from people and give them a chance and bring them in. What neighborhood better than that is? Cronites at the time. And, and, and he was so right in his forward thinking in 1940 because years later, years later, Cronites became an Orthodox neighborhood because Brownsville went south. So they all moved to Crown Heights. So Kronites became, and, and I say Orthodox, I don't mean Lubavitch, Chabad. Chabad in 1950s and 60s in Crown Heights was the small group. But then in 1960s, when, when, they, when everyone moved out again, you know, we are, we're always running. You know, you, know, you know, we're always running. Where are you running? When something gets rough and tough, we run. So everyone ran away from Crown Heights to Borough Park, to New Jersey, to Staten Island. You know, who stayed? Only the Lubavitchers. Why? Because the Rebbe made a big, big deal in 68 and 69. He spoke about it publicly. They had meetings. They brought Moshe Feinstein to come to a meeting and say that it's forbidden to move and sell your house to a non-Jew at that time. And this left a big, big impression uh, on the Hasidim. And the majority of them stayed, and those that stayed, and there were some that bought houses from the other from Jews that just left. And today they, <laughs> they, they, they benefited so much on the real estate. So that's the history of how Chabad got to Crown Heights. But talking, but talking, about, talking about the previous Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok, He's known in the greater Jewish world as the Ish Hamasiras Nefesh, the man of self-sacrifice, because during that time in Russia, the 1920s, Stalin, Stalin shut down, he shut down Judaism basically, you know that, right? He basically gave an edict that no, that no uh, yeshiv, cheders and Talmud Torahs, anything that's associated with Jewish children should be shut. And I emphasize that because he wasn't against old geezers, old people learning. And in fact, it's so interesting that in Moscow, where the KGB was located, the main uh, uh, hub of the KGB, he let a shul, a shul function in 1927. That shul became the center for today's Chabad. It's called Marina Russia. And it was right, right, right there where the KGB was, 1927. So how, how is it? The answer is very simple. He didn't care 
about elderly people. You know, they're old and, you know, it's just a matter of time. Go, learn, dive in. That didn't bother him. But anyone who was caught teaching children or the youth, they were counter-revolutionaries. And the Friede Kerebe put up a fight and said, we are not going to allow this and we're going to lead yeshivas in the machteret. Machteret means the underground. And he sent uh, his students, people like my wife's grandfather and Mendel Futafa, some of those names you might uh, be familiar with, he sent them anywhere and everywhere throughout greater Russia, Ukraine, all over to do this. And they were young and energetic and they were committed. And they, and they led this underground. In 1927, they, they arrested the previous Rebbe. They, you know, they, they gathered documentation and uh, evidence that he was the leader of the underground movement, and just yesterday I was reading, they found the tick, the case, um, and they have it printed with the interrogation questions of the witness who's, who put the file together, and then the interrogation of the previous Rebbe, some of which we didn't have before. And they arrested him, and basically he writes that he saw when when they released him. On Yud Beis Tammuz, he saw that uh, before that it was written that he is sentenced to be shot and killed. And he saw that it was crossed out. So, on the 3rd of Tammuz, which is a week and a half ago, on the 3rd of Tammuz, they told him, we're not going to kill you, but we're going to send you away for three years, hard labor in a city called Kastrama. And they figured, like so many others, he'll die over there from starvation and illness and everything else. And that was the edict that they gave on the 3rd of Thomas. And then on Yud Beis, and a week and a half later, they ruled that um, he can go free, they're not going to send him, that he's not going to have to go there as well. Actually, he did go to Kastrama, but they ruled that he could leave right away. It was a Thursday when he got the ruling, so he asked, he asked, when will he arrive in his, in his house, I think in Leningrad? They said, on Shabbos, the train, you will get there only on Shabbos. So he said, I'm not going. The Rebbe once spoke about what I'm telling you now. In, in Russia at the time, just as you were forced to go into jail if they took you in. When they let you go, you were forced to get out. And, and, and they told him in particular, you have six hours to meet with your family and get on a train and leave Russia. We don't want you in our country, you're a troublemaker. So he told them, I'm not going. They couldn't believe it, they're letting him go. And he says, I'm not going, why? Because I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna come on Shabbos. They called uh, Moscow, I think, and Moscow said, just let him do what he wants. And Itake didn't leave till Sunday. That's the story. That's the story. Un how? Unbelievable. Yeah, that's, unbelievable. A that's a fact. That's a fact. This is not made up. That's a fact on the ground. So, what do we see? We see a Masiras Nefesh that he, he's ready to die for Yiddishkeit. At the same time, he's so meticulous about keeping a halacha. And, and believe me, any rav you would ask would tell you it's pikuach nefesh to be in, 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 in the, the, under the Russian authorities. And you should go on Thursday, even if you arrive on Shabbos. And number two, it's not maybe a nisidar isa because you're not driving, you're only sitting in a train. And, and you know what I'm saying? So pikuach nefesh and everything else, no. It's out of the question. We see here another important point to emphasize how meticulous he was and how from he was. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was a very religious person who cared about halacha. I'd like to see how many non-Lubavitcher people would say, I want to stay in jail with these with mice and rats and everything else over Shabbos. I'd just like to see that from the biggest Rosh Hashivas. 
I bet you'll get a big zero. The Friedrich the Rebbe did this. Fact. And this the Rebbe pointed out once at a Fabrengen shows us how how halacha and 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 Torah is so much is so important to the Chassid. Contrary to the you know fallacy that a Chassidim are lax in halacha, it's just the opposite. No, another point that we emphasize on Yud Beis Tammuz and Yud Gimel Tammuz is the previous Rebbe's Avas Yisroel for every Jew, and this too needs a little a background. At the time, I believe in 1924. Rabbi Chaim Oizer Gordensky, the chief rabbi of Vilna, the Chofetz Chaim, and other Gedoyle Yisrael, they formed what was called the Avad, Avada Yeshivas, a committee for the Yeshivas to fund the Yeshivas and help them either stay where they are, which most of them did not, like for example the Slabotka Yeshiva in 1924 moved to Eretz Yisrael. There was a branch that was left in, in, in Lita, but the, the body and the Rosh Hashiva, both Rabbi Nosson Tzvi Finkel, the grandfather of Rabbi Finkel, who was named Nosson Tzvi, who passed away a few years ago, and uh, Rabbi Moshe Mardcha Epstein, etc., they moved along with the Yeshiva a year later, whatever, but uh, they moved to Eretz Yisrael. So, the backing for a lot of this came from the Vada Yeshivas. And Reb Chaim Eiser, he was the one who was the final authority of the, how much funds should go here and how it should go he, there. He was the most respected uh, Rav in, in, in this area. And um, they listened to his, his directions. Anyway, people don't know and I hope to uh, uh, publicize it um, in my chapter on Rabbi Chaim Oizer, my next book, Chabad and Gedolim, number two, where Rabbi Chaim Oizer and the Chofetz Chaim and the previous Rebbe signed on public decla declarations in the 1920s on behalf of Yiddishkeit Judaism in Russia. Numerous declarations, and guess what? You know who initiated those declarations? Not Rabbi Chaim Oizer. Surely not the Chofetz Chaim was much more quiet and tamed, you know, unto himself. It was the previous Rebbe. Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok was a big activist, a very big activist. Now, Rabbi Chaim Meiser pretty much worked with the, with the Litvish community uh, and, it's, and, and the ones who were involved with him. The previous Rebbe, we see, clearly extended himself both to the Litvish community and to the Hasidic community. And we have documentation of this. Friedrich Rebbe's motto of Avas Yisrael, following his great grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, in Tanya, chapter 32, was that every single Yid is special. And that's why, in a letter that he wrote in 1928, in preparation of celebrating the first year of his redemption, we call it in Hebrew the Chadag Yiula of Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tammuz. He writes in the letter, Not only did Hashem redeem me, Every single year that's even just nicknamed a Jew, even he was redeemed on Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tamus. And our Rebbe would, took this line of his father-in-law in this letter of 1928, and every single Yud Beis Tammuz, he mentioned it, and he spoke about it, and he developed it, and he opened it up in many various ways. But the Nakuda, the point is that it, the way it's written is it's a nickname, right? I'm a Jew by nickname only. I don't keep mitzvahs, I'm not, don't learn teira, you know, I'm ke'echot ho'amim, I'm like one of the, anyone else. And the Red Friedrich Rebbe says just the opposite. Even, even, if you think you are such a Jew, but the fact is you're called a yid, 
then you are plugged in in the essence of Hashem and you're one of us and we care for you, we care for you. That was his Nekuda. And that's why, you know, you, you look at what, they, what he and his, and his Hasidim did in Russia in those years, there were many, many Yidin who were already non-religious. Haskola got to them from the turn of the century till 1927. I mean, you, you imagine those, you know, I'm sure you've read and heard, and, and some of you might, might have had grandparents like this, or, you know, parents. There was a fallout of Yiddishkeit and communism, and the isms of the time schlepped away good minds. I mean, I, I always say this. I take a look at some of the great-grandfathers. Their beards are till here, and the big yarmulke, with the payas, with the whole gestel, and you take a look at a picture side by side of their son, clean shaven, no yarmulke, looks like a bundes, you know, like what's going on here? It was a real, real departure. And in many families, I would say in most families, be it Germany, Poland, uh, Russia, and even Hungary, you know, the, 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 the times were so challenging for the youth. The poverty was so great in most places. The anti-Semitism was terrible that the youth said, enough, we don't want this anymore. You know, my own family. Um, I was telling my wife yesterday, I have a picture of my um, grandfather who has, he's wearing a sailor's hat, you know, with a long beard, you can see a long coat, he's holding a Gemara, he was a Malamed in Poland, in there outside of Warsaw, half an hour, 45 minutes outside of Warsaw, right? Next to him are two, his wife, and she looks like, you know, so from with her, with her shaitl sorts, like an old bubby, a babushka they call it in Russia, a babushka, you know? And um, next to them are their two sons, Yosef and Yeshaya who I heard from my grandfather growing up that he had, they were never killed by the Nazis, but he had two brothers, Yosef and Yeshaya, who were Tmibim, who were so sincere, Talmud Chachamim. And I took a look at this picture. I just got it from a, from a cousin this past year. And it was so indicative of what my grandfather taught me when I was, told me when I was 10 years old, 8 years old, talking about his, his brothers who perished in the, the Muhamma. And you see them with these the, the kasketlach and the little beards growing in. Then you have a picture of, of my grandfather and his older brother Chaim standing there as well in the picture. They're clean shaven, they're wearing a nicer suit, they're obviously more modern. And I don't know if they had yarmulkes. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Clearly you know, and my grandfather, as far as I know, stayed from the whole time. Chaim didn't. His older brother didn't. And Chaim left to Costa Rica in 1929. 1929, he left to Costa Rica. Why? Because, he, you know, that's it. He, he was sick and tired of the life in Poland, living in one room with, you know, two rooms. It was just Kiferlach. And he was very successful, and he actually sent the visa to bring my grandfather after the war to Costa Rica, etc. And that's how they came to America afterwards. What's my point? My point is that the poverty was so, was so great, and the, the youth were, were, were smart and intelligent, and they wanted to exceed, succeed, one in business, one in education. So the Friede Kerebe was, was battling this in, in Russia. Another point you need to know, in the yeshivas that stayed, let's say the Mir yeshiva, the Tells yeshiva, the Radin yeshiva, Radin was the Chofetz Chaim, Mir was Mir, and, 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 and the other yeshiva, Tells, uh, these were all Litvish yeshivas, and they had lots of Bacharim, right? Many of them had students from Hasidic backgrounds, right? So if you lived in, in, in Lita, 
during the wartime or even after, it was difficult. I'm talking about the First World War. It was difficult interwar period. It was difficult to travel. You wanted your son to go to yeshiva, so he went to the local yeshiva. It wasn't like it was today, you know, I'm a chassid, I'm a litvak, I, choose, I can choose where to go. It was very different. The culture was different. A yeshiva is a yeshiva, they're learning, it's good. What happened? What happened was that chas- students, boys from chassidish backgrounds who came with a, with, with a beard or, or with payas, or with a kasketel, they saw Litvish Bacharim, who in most of the yeshivas were clean-shaven, and they were more modern, especially in Slabotka, where they wore a tie, and they wore a nice suit, and polished shoes. They said, wait a minute, we like that. Why do we have to be so fanatical? And they, they started to drop their Hasidic practices. This was a big problem. In, in many communities, it's not spoken about because <laughs> people are kind of embarrassed to talk about it, you know. But this was in Bells, okay? Bells, the, the Hasidish Bells, you right? You know what kind of fallout there was in Bells in, in the 20s and 30s? It was Geferlach, okay? In Ger, you know what was going on in Ger? You, 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 you wouldn't believe Ger. Ger today owns Jerusalem, right? Ashdod. Yeah, well, this, this same Ger had big fallout of the youth in, in the 20s and 30s. The Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, cared for them, for all of these groups, and he sent Lubavitcher students who were scholarly to infiltrate the yeshivas, and, and, and not to make anyone, just to get the Hasidish, the Bacharim, the students from Hasidish backgrounds, to keep their Hasidic tradition. You can learn in a literature yeshiva. No problem. And he didn't send them to make the literature boys Hasidim. He just wanted the Haslonim and Hasidim. Slonim. Slonim was, you know, had a yeshiva, Baranovich. So there was Rabbi Alchon of Asim's yeshiva. It was, it had a lot of Slonim and Talmidim. Um, Tells had a lot of Lubavitcher Talmidim. And uh, Baranovich had a lot of slonim. You know, how do you keep them to follow the practices of slonim and be Hasidim? So this was a this was a culture fight. So the Rebbe sent Rebbe Zalman Garari and other names that we we came here to America. We know who they are. Some some perished in the Holocaust. But you see, in thirty one and thirty two, I documented a lot of this because it's very interesting. And he, and he wants to know how many of these students are in this yeshiva. And what's the, what are they studying? And, you know, to try to give them a, uh, to reignite their Hasidish feelings. Because it was dwindling. And, and it was going out the window. It's interesting, later in Tells, for example, in Cleveland, post-Holocaust, you had some uh, students from Hasidic backgrounds who went to Tells, and they also started to, you know, become more modernized. And Rabbi Gifter El Shalom, you know, he was adamant. You come here, if you come here with a beard, you keep your beard. If you don't come with a beard, their policy was you shouldn't grow a beard, <laughs> which Lubavitch, of course, had a problem with. You know, why do you have such a policy? But if you came here with a beard... You don't take off your beard. If you came with a long reckle, a long frock, you keep your long frock. You, this is not a place to modernize yourself. And to the credit of Rabbi Gifter, who was known over the years, later years, as an opponent to Lubavitch and the Rebbe, but certain principles that he had, to me, speak of a very uh, legitimate respect for Hasidim and Hasidis, although he himself was very far from it. So the previous Rebbe had to create this enthusiasm to reignite it, I should say, by these students. And that's something else that he did that it's not spoken about, so I thought that I would mention it to you, you know, now, because it's important. Hilla, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, just a question. You know, the early pictures of the Rebbe before he became Rebbe and when and when he became Rebbe, uh, and and a lot of the pictures of like the yeshivas of Europe in you know the first half of the 20th century 
a lot of the young men have sh sort of shorter beards and are wearing modern looking clothing and so on. So I, I just want to know sort of your take on what all that meant at that time. The, 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 it, it, it meant uh, that modernity was very much part of the culture, no question about it. Uh, it w but I mean, you, here you see even even the rabbi looked pretty fashionable. The picture behind you, you know. Right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to. Uh, so it looks more new world than old world. Yes, I'm, I'm going to explain that. The uh, the the culture in France, or with this picture, this picture I think is in in in. I think it's in France. I think the custom was to wear a gray hat. Custom. That was part of the, the culture. The Rebbe shied away from, <laughs> from being in a rabbinic position, okay? A piece of history. The previous Rebbe who we're talking about and celebrating, he wanted, he wanted, he was always looking for ways to bring the Rebbe into to, to the, um, the rabbinic world. And the Rebbe took the Rambam's words literally don't make a Parnassah from Torah. And he, and he did things kind of to show a more modern look, like I, with my gray hat, I'm going to be a rabbi of a shul without a long black frock and a hat. So in the 1935 or so, I forget, the previous rabbi writes to him, I spoke to someone, and there's a good potential for you to become the rabbi, the rav of the shul, of the shul in France somewhere, I think, or somewhere there. And the rabbi writes back, with all respect to his father-in-law, thank you very much for thinking about me, but I'm, I'm not ready to do this. And we see this. It's, it, now, the, the rabbi rolled up his beard at some point, maybe in that picture, right? He never shaved his beard, and he, not, he didn't trim his beard, but he made his beard look, you know, nicer. Um, whether he did that because his wife wanted or did it himself, I don't know. So I don't see it as a, a modernization, but I do see it as a, a way of fitting into the culture so that, you know, he was very hatsnei leches. I mean, I heard testimony. There's someone here, lives on my block. His father was the shamish or gabai in the shul in France, in Paris, with the Rebbe David. You hear this? So he told me, he told me that the Rebbe sat in the last uh, bench, and when he davened, when he got up, he faced the wall, the back wall, not face. He was so private, and he says we couldn't get a word out of him. Only when we asked him to give a shear once in a while did he speak. But otherwise, and he would say, uh, you know, I don't want to see what's going on in the front, and sometimes people argue and talk and debate. I'm just saying, he, he was very, very hatzli leches. This week's Haftorah, right? She, yesterday's Haftorah ends, v'hatzli leches im Hashem. You should walk in a path of, of modesty. So, but, but overall, Hillel, your observation is, is, is a, a correct observation. There was a, a very much a leaning towards modernity. And that's why, not just the, the Lubavitch, but say the Satma Rav, right? Or uh, let's say Rabbi Gifter. I mean, the, the people who tasted... European Jewry and were of rabbinic nature, they, 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 they wanted and they created in America to go back to kind of an old-fashioned Judaism, everyone in their style. So the Satma Rebbe says, wear your beard, your, your streimel, and then with all the eight garments of the Kohen Gadol, you know, wear, wear it outside in the public, and walk in the street of Williamsburg, and be proud, and, you know, and flaunt your, you know, that. And he took Hungarian jewelry, who, you know, were very far from that, and they started to grow their beards and wear streimlich, and this became the credo till today. Lubavitch had its style, the Litvish had their style. But everyone was definitely um, sensitive to the modernity at the time. I just want to conclude with one more thought, and that is that uh, Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tamuz was considered by our Rebbe such a Yom Simcha that once it happened to be like this, where Yudbeis Tamos was Shabbos. 
So the Rebbe like instructed the Chazan to said something like about instead of saying Berina to say Besimcha in Lechodoidi Friday night. And it's very interesting because really it's only for a yomtif, a yomtif, halachic yomtif, not you based Tammuz that's celebrated though pretty much only by Lubavitchers. But here we see to the Rebbe, his, what he saw in Yud Beis Tammuz was equivalent, was saving Yiddishkeit, was saving Torah and Halacha. So for him it was the greatest Simcha. So he, he gave instruction to save a Simcha. And it's not against Halacha. It's not against Halacha, otherwise he wouldn't do it. But I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out this because a tzaddik, a tzaddik who sees something and feels something and shares it with with the with the crowd, shares it with the people, it gives you an insight to the importance of the day, to the specialty of the day. So today is, is all days Yud Gimel Tamos. And again, why do we celebrate two days, Yud Beis and, and Chabad? We don't say Tachnum both of these days. It's because he didn't get the actual paper. The office was closed till Yud Gimel, till the 13th of Tammuz. And he says that we should share this with our children and grandchildren and family and friends. So you'll all be having supper later. You'll be talking to your friends and your family. So tell them that today is a special day about a great tzaddik, who you happen to be learning his Hasidus. I mean, we're learning, we're learning the Maimorim, and we've been learning basically for three years his Maimorim. So our group in particular owes the previous Rebbe a big Yashikoach for opening the door to an area that's not really discussed much in the Hasidic world as well, the psychology and Torah angle together. And, and to, to me, like I've told you many times, it's a fascinating real important study how to develop al pitora and al pi the 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 your psychological issues of that we we encounter daily and um i thank the previous rebbe every day for for writing these maimorim and saying these maimorim you know which some might say oh it's more than simple you know Hasidus, kapola deep ideas spheros and you know he said from torah or yoni you know um Flutin tootin uh, ideas are, you know, sophisticates, you know, Albert Einstein's of Hasidus. But he's writing about the Nefesh Abamis, Nefesh Elikis, a taiva, you know, like, so, such human, um, human nature things, you know, and that's exactly it. That he was able to bring down the deepest ideas into human nature. Because if in human nature you don't f- see it, you don't really understand it. You don't really understand it. The Torah has, really understanding of Torah is when you see it in daily life and, and the idea becomes real to you. And, and that's true for Gemara too. You know, someone who's really trained in the ideology of Gemara, you know, sees it in the real world. I'll give you an example. I was once in the old city in the Tzamach Tzedek Shul in Yerushalayim. I had a friend of mine from Manhattan with me, and Rabbi Steinsaltz Davins there. He is the unofficial rabbi of that shul. Because when they conquered the old city in 67, the rabbi right away said they should make the first Shabbos a minion in the shul. So Rabbi Sedel, that's Rabbi Uri Kaplun's, uh, I think, father in law. Um, it, 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 so Rabbi Segel, because he blew the chauffeur over at the Kotel, you know, you know the whole story. So he he uh, went to Daven there, and the, some of the Hasidim that were there, Rabbi Steinzel included, uh, also came. I don't know if that first Shabbos, but subsequently they they kind of it was our property the, the, from the time of the Tzemach Tzedek, right from that time. So they made a minion there, and he became the unofficial Rav. So the, the, after Davening. My friend and I went over to him, and my friend said, I have a question for you, Rabbi. I'm learning this section in, in, in Tractate uh, Sanhedrin, and he told him what he's learning, and he says, but I don't see its relevance to, to, to my life. And I was standing there, I didn't say a word, I just was listening to a conversation between my friend and Rabbi Steinzeltz. And, and my friend at the time wasn't yet religious. Today's uh, very uh, a Lubavitcher, a religious and all that. So he, Rabbi Steinzeltz, presented the same piece of Gomorrah 
in its broader context, and he showed him how this nitty-gritty, seemingly insignificant discussion in the Gemara is relevant to your life and my life and our life, and it's very real. Because he took it out of its narrow narrowness, and he presented the greater picture that the Gemara is talking about. So, and what, and it was, for me, it was an eye-opener, because you don't learn Gemara that way in yeshiva. You don't learn Tafayomi that way. You know, you, you, you learn. So when you learn about one animal goring an ana, other animal, and you should pay 50% or 100%, that's the discussion. You like it or you don't like it, you know? But what's the, gro- the broader context? In other words, to explain the opinions of the Gemara and the opinions of Rashi and the opinions of Taisvis and the commentaries and what are these nuances adding in the overall approach to life, that's a, that's a whole different discussion. And, and at that time, I heard Stein Zaltz explain that to this, to this friend of mine and it blew me away. It was fascinating, you know. Now, whether he could do that in every piece of Gemara, I don't know. But, but the point is, there is that expansiveness to a piece of Gemara. Again, we don't learn Gemara that way, and, and maybe we should do more of that, and, and maybe the, the youth will be more interested in staying and learning Gemara in Yeshiva. I don't know. You know but, 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 but the point is, there is, there is the greater picture of Torah. So the Frida Kareba, I was saying, Moshe, you weren't here before, I was saying, the Frida Kareba did this with the Hasidus. He took ideas that his grandfather and great grandfather from the Alte Rebbe, which which many times is very aloof and very sophisticated and very non seems non practical, and it brings it into psychological issues, and that's why we have a big Yashikoyach to say to to the Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok the Bal Hagiula today for allowing us to for giving us these type of discourses to study and to, to, to dialogue and to analyze and, and to use in our daily life. So I think if for us, it's in particular, Yud Beis and Yud Gimel Tamus is a personal simcha. It's not just a simcha from once upon a time. It's a personal simcha because I know that um, the Shabbos, you know, I'm sitting in David and I think about the mimer we're learning and to rethink it, I, I see how it's in the bloodstream. It's getting to the bloodstream. Anyway, everyone have a great day. Good Yom Tif to everyone. And we should talk, have the Geula Shleimah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.